Welcome to our first session with Professor Daniel Matt of Becoming Elijah, Prof Prophet of Transformation. Um, we'd like to extend our gratitude to Mr. Alan Mansfield for his sponsorship of this class in honor of Professor Matt and his lyrical translation of the text of the Zohar, as well as his profound commentary, which ex explicates the text Midrashic and Talmudic allusions. Professor Matt is a scholar of Kabbalah. He taught for many years at Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where he lives with his wife, Hannah. His books include The Essential Kabbalah, translated into eight languages, God and the Big Bang, and his monumental nine-volume annotated translation of the Zohar, which I mentioned before. And most recently, he's written Becoming Elijah, Prophet of Transformation, published by Yale University Press, which will also be the topic of this class. As always, we encourage you to ask questions either by unmuting yourself or by putting questions in the chat. If you're comfortable doing so, we'd love for you to turn on the camera and actively participate throughout the class. Um, you're welcome to accept, accept the invitation to be a panelist. Um, regardless, don't worry. It doesn't mean you'll actually have to speak or be a panelist. It will just give you the option to uh, show us your face and unmute yourself to ask questions. Um, please try to stay muted when not speaking. And you're welcome to ask questions, again, like I said, in the chat or on the Facebook comments. Um, I'm gonna put the source sheet in the um, in the chat in just a moment, and um, really looking forward to this. Over to you, Professor Matt. Thank you, thank you very much. Wonderful to be here and uh, to explore this fascinating figure of Eliyahu Hanavi. Uh, I'm going to be teaching texts. Uh, I'm going to share screen so that you can see them, uh, and I think you can all access this through the chat. Uh, and Risha can also send it to you. And then we'll pause at a couple points for questions and answers. We only have an hour right now, so uh, let's just start right away. Okay, these are the texts. This is actually an 18 page document. I'm not intending to cover everything over the next uh, few sessions. But today we're going to focus on, on Tanakh, on Eliyahu in the Bible. Eliyahu is such a fascinating figure, and it's hard to talk about him without mentioning the Seder uh, and all the various folk tales, the imagery, the transformation, really, that happens with Elijah. And the main thing I want to explore eventually is that transformation, is how Elijah changes from his biblical portrait, his biblical personality, you might say his biblical career, to his post-biblical career. And that transformation is amazing. And that's why he's such a fascinating figure. But in order to understand Eliyahu, we really have to start with the pshat, with the simple text of the Bible. And that's what I wanna focus on today. I'm gonna to ask the questions, any questions you have, I'd ask you to limit them today to Elijah in the Bible. We may stray from that uh, momentarily here and there. But let's focus on Elijah in the Bible today, and then next week we'll move into what happens in rabbinic literature and Kabbalah with the Seder and uh, many other things. Let's start um, here with the very first line, Elijah in the Bible, Eliyahu, just his name, the name itself. It's such a unique name. Um, many biblical names, of course, have a divine element in them, right? El. Uh, right, or Yah, but Eliyahu has two. Eliyahu, you can say, is suffused with divinity. So his name means what? My God is yud heh vav -Heh. Yahu is simply an abbreviation of yud heh vav -Heh, the holiest name of God, a four-letter name, yud heh vav -Heh. Yahu, as you can see in the Hebrew, is just uh, three of those letters. So it's El, God, and Yahu. Hey, really, it's Eli, and Yahoo. It's really the Yud, it's really serves double duty, right? The Yud Eli and the Yud for Yahoo. And that's in fact why you have a Dagesh in the Yud. Look here, this is the full spelling in the Tanakh. You see a Dagesh in the Yud because the Yud is double. Eli, my God, Yahoo. My God is Yahoo. Eliyahu is permeated with God. You could say he's obsessed with God, he's in love with God. He is fighting for God's honor. Now, why does he have to fight for God's honor? Because there's a competitor. The main competition to yud heh is, of course, the Canaanite god Baal. Or you might say the couple of Baal and Asherah, the male and female Canaanite divinities. We know that the Israelites were attracted to that Baal worship. We already have mention of that in the Torah. 
of course, with another zealot, with Pinchas, the other famous zealot of the Bible. Pinchas and Eliyahu are the two great biblical zealots. And in fact, there's a tradition that Pinchas is Elijah. We'll come to that later, a very bizarre idea that Pinchas is none other than Elijah. But in any case, the two of them are the two great zealots in the Bible. And Elijah is really jealous on the for God. He's jealous for God. He feels that the Israelites have strayed into this worship of Baal or Baal and Asherah, and he wants to bring Israel back to the true worship of yud That's really Elijah's goal. That's his whole raison d'etre, his whole purpose of being, is to bring people, the straying people back to the true worship, to the worship of the true God. Let's look at his first appearance. Chapter 17 in the book of, of Malachim. Uh, some, some of you may have a Tanakh open, but uh, it's good to have it nearby, but you can, I think, make use of the Hebrew and English here. I'm going to move back and forth between the Hebrew and the English. I understand there's quite a range of Hebrew fluency today, um, but we're going to treat ourselves to some of the Hebrew at least. Anytime I read the Hebrew, you can follow along in the English. Okay, some I'll read in Hebrew and some in English. The very first mention we have of Elijah in the Bible is in the first book of Kings, chapter 17. And out of nowhere, what do we hear? Vayomer Eliyahu HaTishbi. Eliyahu the Tishbite Mitoshave Gilad, one of the residents, the inhabitants of Gilead. Gilead simply means the Transjordan, right? The, the east bank of the Jordan River. That's where Elijah either was born or was raised or lived. We don't know much about his life before his prophecy. But he's identified as from the town of Tishbe and in the region of Gilead. So he comes to Ahab, who is Ahab, of course, King Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. But at this point, the tribes have already split. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. We're talking here about the ninth century BCE, uh, a few generations after David and Solomon and then the splitting of the kingdom into Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north. King Ahab is the king in the north, a rather successful king um, in political terms and economic terms. The country was well off. He was making alliances with neighbors, neighboring rulers, including one of them, the king of Tyre. Tyre is a city-state on the Mediterranean coast, a little bit north of the Israelite border. And King Ahab made an alliance with the king of Tyre. And as part of that alliance, uh, actually earlier already, King Ahab's father, Omri, had initiated this alliance. Ahab was married to the daughter of the king of Tyre, a Phoenician princess named Jezebel. We all know Jezebel. She's described very negatively in the Bible and in later tradition. She was the queen. She was the wife of Ahab. She was a Phoenician princess. So Ahab married her as part of this diplomatic overture to ruling uh, neighboring states and powers. Ahab is the king, but because he's married to Jezebel, now the worship of Baal has increased. Uh, Jezebel brings her own version of Baal worship along with her when she comes to live with King Ahab. And because of that, Elijah now confronts Ahab and says, what? By the life of Yudhe Vavhe, God of Israel, whom I have served, there shall be no rain or dew these years except by my word. Okay, Elijah declares a drought. There will be a drought. Elijah doesn't say why, but it's pretty clear the reason why is because of the worship of Baal and Asherah, because the people have rejected the worship of God, or basically the people are trying to, to have it both ways. They want to worship God, but also worship the local Canaanite deities. Ahab himself is involved in this worship, so Elijah declares a drought. You can imagine this doesn't go over very well with the king or the queen, and, and Elijah has to flee. He flees to a brook, a brook uh, named Crete, a Nachal Crete, the, book of, the, the brook of Crete. Elijah has to escape. And he isolates himself there and he's miraculously fed. And Elijah is characterized by miracles really throughout his career. Elijah is miraculously fed at this creek, 
ravens bring him food and he has water from the creek. But remember, there's a drought and Elijah now suffers himself from the drought because the creek dries up and God tells him to move to another location. Elijah is always on the move. He really never settles down in any one place, it seems. And Elijah is told to go to the town of Sarfat. Sarfat in modern Hebrew means France, but in the Bible, it's the name of a town, a village uh, in the Phoenician territory. In English, it's called Sarepta, little town of Sarfat. Elijah is told to go there, and he's told to, that a certain widow there will take care of him, will feed him. He finds the widow, but the widow is starving to death. <clears throat> the widow is on the verge of starvation, is starving. Her child is, is starving with her. And Elijah performs his first miracle. And there was a miracle performed for him at the brook of Crete. But now he performs a miracle. He miraculously feeds the woman. And she has one jug of oil and one jar of flour. And he promises her that that oil, that flour will not run out for as long as the drought continues. And then the woman's child suddenly dies or becomes comatose. And Elijah revives the child. Elijah brings this child back to life. Let me show you a picture here. This is a, a picture of, uh, that's another picture we'll see in a moment. This is a picture of Elijah with the widow of Tsarfat and her little boy. And this is uh, at the point where he's saying, um, what do you have to eat? And the woman is saying, we have nothing. All we have is this empty bowl. I have barely enough to make a meal for my son or myself. We're, we're gonna eat our last meal and die. You can see the compassion here. It's an amazing picture because you don't see Elijah's eyes at all, but you can tell his compassion from the look on the face of the widow and her child. Let's come back to the text. So Elijah miraculously feeds the widow. He revives the child. This is the first time in the entire Bible that we hear anything about the uh, revival of the dead. And that's characteristic of Elijah. But Elijah is one who never dies, according to many traditions, as we'll see. So Elijah's immortality is really hinted at here. You could say Elijah is the one who can overcome death. Here he overcomes the death of the child. Eventually, he seems he'll overcome his own death. And we're about ready for the first dramatic story uh, in a large setting. But first, look at this quota number three. Elijah is elusive like the Ruach. Elijah is compared to the Ruach. This is very significant because later Elijah will be the one who inspires people, the one who conveys Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And already in the book of Kings, he's associated with the Ruach, he's linked with the Ruach. So Elijah has saved the, the widow's life and the life of her child. And then God says, it's time to meet Ahab again. A couple of years have gone by. The drought has lasted perhaps three years. And Elijah is told by God that it's time to meet Ahab and to end the drought. So Elijah goes to meet Ahab. He runs into a servant of Ahab's named Obadiah, Ovaja. Look at number three here in the PDF. Elijah is elusive, like the Ruach with which he's associated. One day, King Ahab's steward met Elijah and Obadiah says to him, when I leave you, the spirit of yud will carry you off to I know not where. Look at the Hebrew here. If I leave you, Obadiah says to Elijah, the spirit, the wind, the power of God will carry you off to I know not where. Okay, let's move ahead to a uh, contest on Mount Carmel, and then we'll pause for uh, a couple of questions. So Elijah tells Ahab to gather the Israelites, all the Israelites, does this mean the entire nation or a significant number of people? In any case, a large number of Israelites assembled on Mount Carmel, along with the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah also calls for the 400 prophets of Asherah. Okay, here you have the male and female divinities of the Canaanite pantheon, Baal and Asherah. 
Jezebel is providing for those prophets. They eat at her table. So Elijah wants all the prophets and all of the Israelites to come to Mount Carmel. And this is what Elijah says to them when they're assembled. How long will you keep hopping between the two branches? If you have is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Okay, look at that image, that metaphor, hopping between the two branches. That's how the Israelites are practicing their religion. They want Yudhevave and they want Baal and Asherah. They're willing to serve both. They want, they want to call out to both powers. And Elijah says, no, you have to make a choice. And he sets up a contest. The contest is who can, who can uh, call down fire from heaven? Okay, each of them, each of them will be given uh, a cow to sacrifice. And each of them has to call down fire from heaven. So the prophets go first. The prophets of Baal, they took the bull that was given to them. I'm going to read the English now so we can move quickly through this passage. They took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound and no one answering. They hopped about the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Call out loudly, for he is a god. Maybe he's defecating or urinating or off on a journey. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. They called out loudly and gashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, till blood spilled upon them. When noon passed, they flung themselves into a frenzy until the hour of the meal offering, but there was no sound and no one answering, no attention. Okay, the prophets fail entirely, and Elijah then takes his turn. At the hour of the meal offering, Elijah the prophet approached and said, yud God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, this day let it be known that you are God in Israel, and I'm your servant, and by your word have I done all these things. Answer me, yud answer me, that this people may know that you, yud are God, and it is you who turned their heart backward. That's an astounding line. It is you who have turned their heart backward. What does that mean? Elijah is calling out almost in desperation. The prophets of Baal have failed. Now it's his turn. Answer me, answer me. Why does he want God to answer him? So the people will know that Yudhevave is God. And what? It is you who turn their heart backward. Look at the Hebrew here. This people will know Elohim, you are God. Okay, you've turned their heart backward. Now, some commentators, some translators try to soften this. And they say, well, what this means is that you, you can turn their heart back to you. The people have strayed and you can turn them their heart back. But that's not what the Hebrew says. First of all, it's in the past tense. You have turned their heart. And it's not back, but backward. Achoranit, this last word here. Achoranit does not mean back, it means backward. So you've turned their heart backward. It seems that Elijah is, is accusing God of leading the people astray. I thought it was the people's choice, the people's mistake. They went over, they went after the false gods. Why does Elijah blame it on God? Okay, Elijah is not a theologian, and this, this has troubled theologians for centuries for millennia, you could say. But what Elijah is really saying, what Elijah is feeling is that God is in control of everything. It's God's decision, it's God's power to bring about whatever happens, even if the people have strayed, even if they've made the choice to reject God or to combine the forbidden worship of Baal and Asherah with the worship of God, the true God, even if they've made that choice, it's ultimately God who enables this to happen, who enables anything to happen, who directs the universe. And that seems to be what Elijah is saying. It's you who've turned their heart backward. God, you brought this about. Now you can bring about the transformation. Immediately, the fire of yud came down and consumed the offering, the wood, the stones, the soil, licked up the water. It was in the trench. Okay, it's not just burning up the sacrifice. It's incinerating the entire site. And all the people saw and fell on their faces and said, Hashem hu ha Elohim. Hashem hu ha Elohim. Okay, we all know that phrase. And uh, it's now, we're already well into the month of Elul. 
And of course, a little more than a month from today, all of us will chant that phrase. Interesting, this phrase that ends the most dramatic time of the Jewish year, the holiest day of the Jewish year, Yom Kippur, what is chanted at the very end of Yom Kippur, at the very end of Megillah, seven times by the cantor and the congregation, Hashem Hu Elohim, the is God. This line is taken from Eliyahu's story. This dramatic moment in Eliyahu's life supplies the formula, supplies the chant at one of the holiest moments of the Jewish year. So the people have been won over. The people have been convinced. This you could say is Elijah's greatest triumph. And in fact, now the rain comes shortly after. Elijah tells, uh, Elijah tells Ahab to quickly go back to the palace because the rain is gonna come. Elijah said, go up, say to Ahab. He tells his servant, tell Ahab, harness your chariot and go down so that the rain will not hold you back. Okay, it hasn't rained for three years. Now it's gonna be a lot of rain. Ahab better quickly get back to the palace and not get stuck in the mud. Meanwhile, the heavens grew dark with clouds and wind and there was heavy rain. Ahab mounted up and went to Jezreel. Yeah, that's where his winter palace was. And the hand of Yerhevave came upon Elijah and he girded his loins and ran before Ahab all the way to Jezreel. You could say this is uh, perhaps the greatest moment of Elijah's career so far. He's won the people back to the worship of Yudhav. He outruns the chariot. The chariot is racing back to Jezreel and, and, and Elijah beats the chariot there. Let's pause now and uh, we can take, uh, let's say two or three questions. We have a lot more to cover, but I want to uh, open it up a little bit. So uh, hi, if you want to call on someone or, or read from the chat, either, sure. either way is fine. So far, we have no questions in the chat. Uh, so if anyone wants to raise their hand. Um, Let's take something live. That would be lovely. You can just sit for a minute, think about this. And uh, as I said, let's try to stay focused on Elijah in the Bible, based on what we've read uh, up, up till now, just up to this account of his first, his first few years. If not, it's not a problem. We'll, we'll sit quietly for a minute. If there are no questions, then I'll continue with Sign up. Uh, we have a um, a, question, a raised hand from Dave Kaufman. Dave Kaufman, do you want to go ahead? Please. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Matt, um, for writing this book and introducing us to Eliyahu. Uh, just for background, I'm in a secular choir who sings Mendelssohn's Elijah, and uh, many people are confused by the story of, uh, of the story of the battle with Baal, and uh, especially our Christian friends find it uh, perplexing. So I'm often having to explain it. It's nice to have another perspective on it. Um, my question was around uh, free will and God's hand. And like Abraham, it's very odd that Elijah has to remind Hashem that all consequences follow from creation and that therefore if God is upset with something, you know, there's some karma circling there involved and and once it's pointed out to him he says oh oh of course okay well here's your fire and the miracle happens it reminds me of uh those kind of holy chutzpah conversations that are in our tradition with moshe and with abraham of reminding uh hashem things that hashem must not already know but seems to hear differently when humans remind him or when a prophet reminds him yeah, Elijah's relationship with God is so fascinating. You're right, he's very bold here. I, I don't think he's actually reminding God. I mean, there's, we don't have an indication that God has forgotten what he can do. But Elijah is, is very, uh, very severe, right? He's an extremist. He's really, he's a zealot. Okay, and he's usually fighting for God. Here he, he's, he's confronting God. Earlier when he brings the child back to life, he actually says, he, I'm paraphrasing. He says, "God, what have you done? You know, this woman, you 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 you've killed her son." He, he accuses God of killing the child. Okay, so he's aware that God can do everything and 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 can you know can take care of any situation, but he's he's demanding that God show his power. Uh, I think what's fascinating here, you said it's just, it's hard to explain this to Christians right, or to Jews. The rabbis are willing to criticize Elijah for things like this. Um, 
for being too harsh, relatively for being too harsh with the people. We will see that more when we get to the rabbinic material. But Elijah's, Elijah gradually becomes Eliyahu Hanavi, right? I mean, the person, the Eliyahu Hanavi that we know in the Bible seems so different than this compassionate hero, right? That, that we're familiar with. And that's what's amazing about Eliyahu, how he changes from being uh, the fiery zealot to a compassionate hero. So, you know, that, that will see gradually unfold. But I want to stay now with the Peshat. The Peshat, what I left out conveniently, what happens when he, when he beats the prophets, when he defeats them, right? He doesn't let them go off, right? He doesn't convert them to Yiddishkeit. He slaughters them. Elijah slaughters all 450 prophets of Baal. It's not clear if that means Elijah did it himself or he, he, had, he had it done. But uh, the simple text is that he, that he, let's take one more question, if there is one. Uh, we see something in the chat. When Elijah says, maybe your God is sleeping, is that meant to be irony? Because there is the verse that the real God does not sleep. Yeah, Elijah is saying, you know, your God might need to be woken up. Our God is, is Shomer Yisrael, lo yanum, lo yishan. He doesn't nap, he doesn't sleep. So Elijah is mocking the prophets of Baal. Uh, certainly, that's that's what's going on. Okay, let's return because uh, there's so much more to cover, and we'll take more questions as we go on. Now, really, one of the great moments of Elijah's multifaceted career, one of the great chapters in the entire Bible, Elijah at Mount Horeb. Okay, why is Elijah at Sinai? Elijah is like Moses, right? Elijah is almost the new version of Moses. So Moses was at Sinai, Elijah is at Sinai. There are many, many parallels. The Midrash adds up dozens, literally dozens of parallels between Elijah and Moses. But perhaps the clearest one is in this chapter. Let me read a little bit of, uh, start with the English, then we'll move to the Hebrew for the central part here. So what happens with Elijah? Ahab gets back to the palace and tells Jezebel what happened on Mount Carmel. And you can imagine Jezebel is not very happy. Her prophets have been killed. And she now threatens to kill Elijah. She threatens to kill him. Why doesn't she just kill him? She sends a message to Elijah saying, uh, by tomorrow, you're going to be like one of those prophets of Baal that you killed. So Elijah gets the hint that he runs off again. Okay, again, he's on the road, on the move. He rode and he goes to the desert. He goes south of Beersheba. There he actually asks God to take his life. He's miraculously fed and revived by an angel. And now we're picking up the narrative here. This is 1 Kings chapter 19. He rose and ate and drank. And by the strength of that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, we're right in the realm of Moses. Now remember, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah is taking 40 days and 40 nights to get there. He's not eating anything, anything more than he ate, just as Moses ate and drank nothing on the mountain. You can see the parallels are already piling up. He walked 40 days and 40 nights as far as the mountain of God, Horeb. Okay, it's not called Mount Sinai, but according to most uh, traditional views, they're identical, Horeb and Sinai. So Moses was at Mount Sinai, and Elijah comes back to the mountain of God. Right, Har Ha'elohim. Then he went into a cave. Hey, Moses, remember, goes into the cleft of a rock. Elijah is in a cave where he spent the night. And look, the word of Yudhevave came to him and said to him, Malachafo Eliyahu, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? That's what God says to him. What does that mean? What are you doing here? Maybe it means, why aren't you with the people? You're a prophet. Why are you running off to the desert? Why do you want to end your life? Fulfill your mission. What are you doing here? What does Elijah reply? This is Elijah's self-description. He replied, Kano kineti. You notice the doubling of the Hebrew there. Kano kineti. Not I have been zealous. Kano kineti. I've been zealously zealous. I've been so zealous for you to have it. Okay, Elijah identifies himself as a zealot. It's not scholars who call him a zealot. It's not rabbis who call him a zealot. Elijah calls, describes himself as zealously zealous. So only one other person is described in a similar way, and that's Pinchas. 
right? Pinchas, God says about Pinchas, the kano et kinati, when he acted on my zeal, when he acted zealously for me. So these are the two zealots, and they both receive this doubling of the verb kuf nun aleph, to be zealous. Of course, it means to be zealous and to be jealous. Okay, in English, the words are very close. In Hebrew, they're identical. Kana means to be zealous or to be jealous. Elijah is zealous for God, and he's jealous on behalf of God. He's jealous for God because the people have rejected God. So Elijah is saying, what are you doing here? This is what I'm doing here. I've been zealous for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, your altars they have destroyed, your prophets they have killed by the sword, and I alone remain, and they've sought to take my life. If that's Elijah's complaint in one sentence, it's one sentence. Look at the Hebrew. By Yomer, kano kineti ladonai elohet svaot, ki azvu vritcha, they've left your brit, b'nei Yisrael. Et mizbachotecha harasu, et neviecha harlu vecharev, v'yivater ani levadi, v'yivakshu et nafshi l'kachta. Amalo. Okay, they've destroyed your altars, they've killed your prophets. Who have they killed? These are prophets who were wiped out by Jezebel, Jezebel and Ahab, probably. And now Jezebel wants to kill him. They've sought to take my life. What does God say? Go out and stand on the mountain before you have Ave. Go out and stand on the mountain before you have Ave. Look, you have Ave is passing by with a great and mighty wind, tearing out mountains and shattering rocks before you have Ave. Not in the wind is Yudhevave. And after the wind, an earthquake. Not in the earthquake is Yudhevave. And after the earthquake, fire. Not in the fire is Yudhevave. And after the fire, kol de mama daka. A sound of sheer stillness. Let's look at, uh, at the Hebrew here. It's so beautiful. Vihine Adonai Over. God is passing by. Veruach gedola v'chazak. God is not in that wind. God's not in the earthquake. God's not in the fire. What comes after the fire? Finally, look at this beautiful Hebrew phrase. It's usually mistranslated. Kol de mama daka is not a still small voice, as it's usually translated. Kol de mama daka, a sound of sheer stillness. Okay, why do I say that? Kol can mean voice, but also sound. De mama is silence or stillness. Daka is thin, subtle, sheer, a sound of sheer stillness. When Elijah heard, Elijah hears that. What does he hear? He hears the silence. He hears the sound of silence. All the dramatic phenomena of nature have come and gone. God is not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. God is in the silence. This is a beautiful inspiration for meditation in Judaism. Where is God to be found? In the Dimama Daka, in that sound of sheer stillness. Maybe God is saying here, learn to be gentle. God is not to be found in these loud, dramatic phenomena. You, you won the people's heart back at Mount Carmel, but that's not how you keep a relationship with the people. You can't just be a harsh zealot. You have to learn to appreciate gentleness and stillness. Maybe that's part of the message here. But it's just a remarkable phrase, called the Mamadaka. When Elijah heard, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And look, a voice came to him saying, Malachapfo Eliyahu. What are you doing here, Elijah? Okay, obviously, the question has been repeated, and biblical scholars argue about whether it really was repeated or whether a scribal error introduced a, a duplication of that question. In any case, Elijah, look how he responds. He replied, he replied, Kano, it's hard to find this because uh, it's the same exact answer. He, when Elijah heard, he wrapped his face in his mantle. Okay, God asks him, he replied, Kano kineti, 
I have been so zealous for you, Hivave, God of hosts, for the lights have forsaken your covenant. Exactly the same answer. God asks the same question. Elijah gives the same answer. Your altars they have destroyed, your prophets they've killed by the sword, and I, I alone remain, and they've sought to take my life. Exactly the same answer. Maybe this is a scribal mistake, but maybe not. Maybe the point is God asks them a question. Elijah gives an answer. Then God reveals himself in the silence. He asks the question again. Has Elijah learned anything? Has Elijah gotten the message? No. Elijah gives the same answer. It's one way to, to, to read. So how does God respond? Yudhevabe said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. You shall come and anoint Hazael as king over Aram. And Yehu, son of Nimshi, shall anoint as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Avel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. There's a lot going on here. We don't have time to go into it in great detail. But basically, God seems to be saying, um, I get your point. The people have strayed. I want you to put in motion a new dynasty. A new king is going to be anointed in Israel. Eventually, it's by Elisha, Elijah's disciple, not by Elijah himself. Yehu becomes king of Israel. Hazael becomes king of Aram. But for us at the moment, what's most important is Elisha. Elijah is told now to anoint Elisha. Why? Because Elijah's career is drawn to a close. Elijah says, the people are out to get me. I have failed. It seems that Elijah feels that he's failed. And God is saying, this is what's going to happen now. And Elisha is now in place to succeed Elijah. Let's look at uh, this material about Elijah's ascent, and then we'll, we'll pause for, for some questions. I realize we're covering a lot here, but that's uh, Elijah. That's of his nature. So Elijah and Elisha go off together. They actually take a kind of farewell tour, uh, going to visit different prophetic disciples. Uh, it's kind of a school of prophets known as B'nai Hanavim, the sons of the prophets. It's really, it's really a guild of aspiring prophets. And Elijah is known to them. Elisha becomes more closely involved with them. Um, but Elijah and Elisha go to visit these schools of prophets before Elijah is going to leave earth. And then comes this account. I'll read it in the Hebrew, and you can look at it here, uh, either the Hebrew or the English. Okay, they were walking along, walking and talking. This is Elisha and Elijah right by the banks of the Jordan River. Vihine rechev ish, a chariot of fire. The Suse ish, horses of fire. Vihine, they appeared. Doesn't say what they did. Vihine, they appeared. Chariot of fire, horses of fire. Vayafridu ben shnehem, separating the two of them. Okay, the fire, the chariot comes right in between Elisha and Eliyahu. Vayal Eliyahu Elijah went up in heaven in a whirlwind, went up to heaven in a whirlwind. The Elisha Ro'eh. Elisha was watching. Buhumit Sa'ek. He cried out, Avi, Avi, Rechav Yisrael, Farashav. My father, my father, Israel's chariots and horsemen. What is it? Who is he calling father? Is he calling out to God? God, my father, here in the chariot. No, he's calling out to Elijah, my father, my father. Right, Elijah is Elisha's father, his teacher. Elisha is calling Elijah father. What does it mean, chariot of Israel? There's a chariot right there, chariot of fire. It seems that he's calling Elijah the chariot. Avi, avi, rechav Yisrael of Rashav. You, Elijah, are the chariot. Why? You are the defender of the people. That's one way to understand that. The low ra'ahu book. He saw him no more. Who saw who no more? Elisha saw Elijah no more. Elijah sailed off to heaven. What does Elisha do? He grasped his garments. He took his clothes. He tore them into. He tore his clothes. Why did he tear his clothes? Because this is kriya, right? From this word, he tore them. The Hebrew term kriya, tearing, is what you do for mourning a close relative. We have that in, in the Bible already, here and, and elsewhere. Elisha is mourning because he thinks Elijah has died. But has Elijah died? The rabbis say no. 
Eliyahu chai v'kayam la'olam. Eliyahu lo ta'am ta'am mita. Never tasted the taste of him. Let's pause here and uh, see if there are a few questions on on those two stories. Okay, we have one question through the Q and A. Uh, I can read to you, or uh, yes, I see that here. Great. Yeah, please, if you, if you can read it, that'd be great. Sure, um, Sarah. I hope I'm. I must hope I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but uh, Sarah Ojins asks, um, if the event at Mount Carmel was successful, why does Elijah become so despondent afterward? Does the people's reconversion last? And if not, why do we evoke this moment on Yom Kippur when we hope to make a permanent change? Yeah, a very interesting question. I, I really didn't go into this deeply enough. So we said this is Elijah's greatest moment, right? His greatest triumph. He brings the people back to God. Hashem hu ha Elohim. Ahab is racing back. Elijah beats him to the palace. But then the problem is that Ahab tells Jezebel. Okay, Ahab, it seems, maybe is neutral. Ahab can be drawn, can be pulled either way toward Yudhevave, toward Baal. He's very impressed by what Elijah has done. The people are temporarily impressed. But Jezebel is not going to give up. So it's really because of Jezebel, according to the biblical account. Of course, everything is blamed on her. I mean, Ahab is punished, but uh, Jezebel comes off in very dark colors in the Bible. Um, so because Jezebel's prophets have been killed, Jezebel lashes out. It seems the people are, are just fickle, right? The people have come back. They've said Hashem Hu Elohim. But Elijah now realizes this probably won't last because Jezebel still has so much power. And of course, immediately she threatens his life. As to Yom Kippur, it's a good question. The people aren't won over permanently. We hope that we will be changed permanently, but it's, uh, you could say it's a struggle. It's, a, it's an annual struggle. It's a daily struggle to really become aware of the divine and to let that work in our lives. So there's no guarantee. I think that's, that's part of the, of the story here. But Elijah performs these miracles and he's so impressive, but uh, the question is, have the people rejected the covenant? Have, have the people been won back or not? And that's the, the the notion of breed, right? Eliyahu is identified so much with breed because what is breed? Breed is also breed milah, circumcision. And Elijah shows up at every circumcision. Why? Because he has to be, it has to be proven to Elijah that the people have not rejected the covenant. That's one way to explain Elijah's appearance at the breed milah. Why does Elijah show up at a ritual circumcision? Because God says, we'll look at this more closely next week. God says to Elijah, I want to prove to you that the people have not rejected the covenant. So I want you to show up at every brit milah and, and witness that. Any other live questions? Be, be brave. We're all here together exploring. None of us really knows the truth about Elijah. So ask a question uh, if anyone would like to. It must be something that's confusing or stimulating or strange or remarkable. Uh, but a hand from uh, Jeffrey Luria. Do you want to go ahead, Jeffrey? Right. Please. Yeah. Um, this may be uh, way off topic, but I keep feeling the echoes of the similarity or parallels between Jesus and Elijah. That is fascinating. I'll speak about it very briefly now, and we'll go to it in more depth, certainly, either next time or, or in the third session. Uh, actually, you know, to answer that question, I, I want to I want to go on with the next text because it, it actually relates uh, directly. There's one other passage in the Bible we have to look at, and I'm glad that that question uh, brings us to it. Number seven: the view that Elijah endures is indicated by the final prophecy in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, if you look at the very last prophecy in, in the prophets, okay, we have Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, Torah, prophets, and writings. What comes at the very end of Nevi'im? The last of all the Nevi'im is Malachi. Okay, his book was written around 500 BCE. The people at, right soon after the return from the Babylonian exile. The end of Malachi. Okay, these are the closing verses of Prophet Malachi. Malachi, you can open it up in your Torah at the very end of Nevi'im. And you, many of you know this because it's a famous Haftarah chanted right before Pesach on Shabbat HaGadol, the Shabbat preceding Passover. 
when we have Elijah in mind, because Elijah will show up at the Seder, hopefully. And this is what Malachi says. Notice he's called her Eliyah, not Eliyahu, but Eliyah. Sorry, I didn't mean to wet that out. Before the great day of Yudhe Vavhe comes. Okay, I'm sending you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the day of Yudhe Vavhe, great and awesome. The Heshiv Lev Avot Al Banim. He'll bring fathers' hearts back to their children and children's hearts to their fathers. Okay, you know, this is very important. Okay, we're, we're long after Elijah's earthly biblical career, okay? Elijah taught and prophesied in the 9th century BCE. Now we're in the 5th century and 6th century BCE, 300 years later, three or 400 years later. And Malachi says, God is, God is speaking. I will send you Elijah before the coming of the day of Yudhe What is the day of Yudhe This is the final day of judgment, the final day of vindication when God will destroy Israel's enemies, restore Israel to the land, rebuild the temple. So you could say this is what eventually is called the messianic era. Okay, the, the Bible doesn't call it Yimot HaMashiach, the days of the Messiah, but the rabbis identify the day of yud with the coming of Mashiach. So if Malachi says Elijah is going to announce the coming of the day of yud for the rabbis, that means Elijah will announce the coming of the Messiah. Okay, this already brings us into the next stage of Elijah's career, what happens to him in rabbinic Judaism, but I want to respond to the question about Jesus because it's very relevant here. If Elijah is going to announce the coming of the Messiah, then you would think that Elijah should have an important role in the New Testament, right? Because Jesus is Christ, according to the New Testament, Jesus is the Messiah. So Elijah must play some role there. And in fact, Elijah does play a significant role in the New Testament because Jesus actually says at one point in the New Testament that John the Baptist is Elijah. Now, why is that so? John the Baptist is the one who anoints, who baptizes Elijah, who baptizes Jesus. So John the Baptist is really announcing the Messiahship or hinting at the Messiahship of Jesus. So it makes perfect sense that, that John the Baptist would be identified with Elijah. And that you do have that in the New Testament, but it's even more interesting than that because. According to the New Testament, Jesus asks his disciples at one point, who do people say that I am? Who do, the, who do people say that, that I am, Jesus says. And his disciples give various answers, one of which is Elijah. So some of the people thought that Jesus was Elijah. Why? Because Jesus really feels himself to be in the prophetic mode. He really feel, he feels that he is a prophet, like a prophet of the Hebrew Bible. And so it may be that Jesus thought of himself as Elijah. That uh, is a possibility, but it's certainly true that Elijah is identified with, with John the Baptist. One other thing about the New Testament, I mentioned that Malachi, the prophet Malachi is the last prophet in the Deim. In the Christian Bible, the Christian Bible, of course, is the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament of the Christian Bible is virtually identical with the Hebrew Bible except for the order of the books. That's the, one of the main differences, the order of the books. Malachi does not appear as the last of the prophet prophetic books. Uh, it doesn't appear in the same way as in the Hebrew Bible. Rather, Malachi is the last book. Malachi is the final book of the Old Testament, according to the Christian Bible. The Old Testament ends with this prophecy about Elijah coming before the day of Yerevate. But what does that mean? If the last page of the Christian Old Testament is this passage, what's the next page? Matthew, the beginning of the Gospels, which means the Christian Bible goes from the, from the prediction of Elijah coming to the account of Jesus coming. So that's, that's remarkable. Let's see if there are uh, uh, any more questions on that or anything we've covered so far. just sit a little and, and think about all this and please feel free to write something in the chat or uh, to raise your hand. And hi, you're allowed to ask a question on your own too. Thank you.
<laughs> it looks like we're fine for now. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, fine. Now let's uh, let's go back to this. And uh, since and this is, I'm going to say something else about the chariot, that, that image of the chariot uh, sailing off to heaven. First off, let me, let me show you a beautiful picture. This is, this is the cover of, of my book, Becoming Elijah. And this is a famous uh, engraving by Doré, Gustave Doré, Elijah ascending to heaven. You see there, this of course is in Yahoo. Down, down here we have Elisha, right there. There wasn't a wall. The wall is here, just you know, it's just a frame of picture. This is happening by the Jordan River. Elijah is sailing off. Notice what's happening here with Elijah. There's a horse of fire, the chariot of fire. These look like clouds, right? But notice here, this is not a cloud. This is Elijah's mantle. Elijah's mantle is kind of woven, interwoven into the clouds. Elijah drops the mantle that falls down. Elisha picks it up. Right, and that is the transmission of Ruach, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the prophetic inspiration is being handed from Elijah to Elisha. Elijah had already thrown the mantle over Elisha when he initiated him, but now Elisha actually inherits the mantle. Now he becomes, now he is the prophet. And that mantle uh, is significant. In Hebrew, it's uh, in Hebrew, it's called Aderet, Aderet Eliyahu, the mantle of Elijah. Eventually, skipping ahead a little bit because we have uh, a few minutes. Eventually, Elijah will become the one who inspires the mystics. Elijah is seen as uh, meeting with certain holy spiritual seekers, and he inspires them. What's remarkable is that Elijah fulfills that same role in Islam and in Christianity. Some of the great Sufi mystics, some of the great mystics of the Muslim tradition, they say that they had an encounter with a mysterious figure known as Al Khidr, the Green One. The Green One is actually a, an Islamic version of Elijah. They are either closely connected or, in some cases, identical. So both in the Jewish tradition and the Muslim tradition and the Christian tradition, Elijah is the one who inspires prophecy, who uh, brings enlightenment. And that, that too has something to do here with the prediction by Malachi that he will come to announce at the end of time. Speaking of the chariot, uh, that actually is the, the origin of uh, of the phrase chariots of fire. Chariots of fire comes from this part of the Bible. The singular chariot turned into chariots. What also is related to this story of Elijah's journey to heaven is the famous song that all of you know, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. That is based on Elijah's chariot. How do we know? It's written by a slave who is dreaming of redemption. So he, he wants to sail off like Elijah sailed off. And remember, you, you know, the verses, I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming for to carry me home, a band of angels. And that is based on what happened to Elijah at, at the Jordan. Just one more example of his, uh, his, his influence. Someone says in the chat, Elisha. Elisha is also very intense, right? Elisha has learned a lot from Elijah and he has some of that same intensity. You have some frightening stories of, of Elisha later. And there actually, there are more miracles taught about Elisha in the Bible that are taught about Elijah, uh, which is interesting. So is there another fiery chariot, another story? Great that you asked that. You do have one other very important description of a chariot. And that, of course, is with another great prophet whose name also starts with an E in English, Ezekiel. Yechezkel, Ezekiel's vision of God, right? The very first chapter of the book of Ezekiel is this wild description of another chariot. This isn't, a, it's not a chariot, it's not a chariot uh, for a human being to, to travel in necessarily, right? Ezekiel doesn't go into the chariot, Ezekiel sees God in the chariot, so it's a chariot throne. That's the other great chariot. But I'm glad that you asked that because 
It is the other important chariot, heavenly chariot uh, in the Bible. What's interesting is that the rabbis connect the two. The rabbis connect the chariot of Ezekiel with the chariot of Elijah. How do they do that? Uh, let's go back to the screen a little to look at the text. Right when uh, this is right as Elijah is about to sail off, as they went along walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared. Okay, that's the mention of the chariot for the first time. What does it mean as they went along walking and talking? It means, of course, that Elijah and Elisha are walking. They're walking and they're talking. That's all that it says. But the rabbis say, wait a minute. What were they talking about? Right? It's not enough that the Bible says they're talking. What were they talking about? So Midrash loves to fill in those gaps in the Bible. How did the rabbis fill in this gap? There are four or five different opinions about what they were talking about. But one of them is they were talking about Ezekiel's chariot. Elijah and Elisha were talking about the other chariot, and then their chariot came. That's how the rabbis connected to. It's really remarkable. Now, what's also remarkable is that Ezekiel hasn't appeared on earth yet. Uh, Elijah is about 300 years before Ezekiel, but that's not a problem for the Midrash. Elijah is aware of that future narrative, Ezekiel's chariot. Anyone else, just uh, put a question in chat if you'd like, or raise your hand if you'd like. We have uh, a few minutes. Let's just sit until the question arises. Please, Monte. Um, yeah. Is it, uh, well, first of all, the, the walking and talking kind of seems evocative of uh, the walking and talking in the Zohar of all, all those characters. Uh, and the other thing is my question is, um, to what extent in Merkava mysticism was Eliyahu really used with, or was it really Ezekiel's vision that they focused on exclusively? They're very interesting. Both of those are interesting. First of all, walking and talking, that is the, as you, as you indicated, that is the method of learning in the Zohar. In the Zohar, the rabbis don't sit in a house of study. They don't sit in a classroom. They're usually out on the road walking usually walking in nature. They'll go for a walk, they'll sit under some trees, they'll say, oh, it looks so beautiful here, let's make it even more beautiful with words of Torah. So nature and walking is central to the Zohar, and it's interesting that that's happening right here, walking and talking. Um, the other thing you mentioned, yeah, Ma'aseh Merkava, the account of the chariot. This is the beginning of Jewish mysticism, you can say. So we have here two, Two important uh, elements in early Jewish mysticism, Ezekiel's vision of the chariot and Elijah. Now, Ezekiel's vision of the chariot is more officially uh, Jewish mysticism, early Jewish mysticism, before the Zohar, before the Kabbalah. What do we have? We have the account of the chariot and speculations about how God created the world, right? What's called Maaseh Bereshit, the account of creation, Maaseh Bereshit, the account of the chariot, those are the two components of early Jewish mysticism. Okay, we're talking about Talmudic period, you know, the first, the, the whole first millennium from one to a thousand. Before we get to the Zohar, before we get to the Kabbalah, early Jewish mysticism is the account of Ezekiel's chariot and trying to speculate, speculating on cosmology, the beginning of, of the world. Elijah, you don't hear about so dramatically there. Where Elijah becomes more central is really. Uh, as a source of inspiration already in the Talmud, certainly, but more so in the Kabbalah. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll certainly focus on that. Anything else uh, quickly before we go? We, we can go a couple minutes over, but I want to uh, hand Maybe, things back to Chaya um, momentarily. Sure. So, Zella? We have, we have a question in the chat. Um, from why why, 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 why oh. don't we go first to, to Zella, just because she's live. And I, oh, sure. Uh, right? Please. I think you have to un unmute, please. Sorry. The only other person who doesn't really die comes at the is in the genealogies at the beginning, Hanok. There's no chariot, there's no fire, there but he's the only other one. So what is there a relationship? Is yes, there something that, we're missing here? Yes, that's fascinating. Glad you brought that up. Hanok, right? Hanok or Enoch. What, what do we hear about in Genesis? It just says how long he lived, and then it says, and he was no more. 
Kilakachoto Elohim. He was no more because God took him. What does that mean? Maybe it means he took him in a chariot. Maybe it means he died. He was no more. He died. God took him. Now, but the rabbis say, well, the rabbis actually don't say much about Enoch, but later Midrashic tradition and later mystical speculation claims that Enoch was taken to heaven and turned into an angel. Not very different than what happens to Elijah. You could say Elijah going to heaven. Many rabbis say that means he became an angel. Now, what's interesting is what? If you look just the pshat, I think it's very important to start with the pshat. Okay, the pshat is what? The pshat seems to be, uh, actually, it's one more important thing about Enoch. By Yitalech, Chanoch, Eta Elohim. Enoch walked with God. That's the full verse, right? Enoch walked with God and he was no more because God took him. So does that mean he was so holy that God took him up to heaven alive? Or does it mean he was holy, he walked with God, and God took him? That's his death. Does it mean he died, or does it mean he became an angel? The shot, I think, is unclear. Yeah. But the later tradition is that he, he was taken to heaven, turned into an angel. What about Elijah? What's the shot? The shot is that he died? Probably. It's not totally clear, but how do, why do I say that? Because what does Elisha do? He tears his clothes. Elisha thinks Elijah's died. Do we know something Alicia doesn't know? Maybe, maybe he didn't die. It's not clear, it's ambiguous. That's the point, both with Enoch and with Elijah, the Peshat is ambiguous. So the Midrash or later tradition fills in the Peshat, but what's the difference? Even if we say Enoch was taken to heaven and turned to an angel, even if we say Elijah was taken to heaven, what's the difference? Enoch never leaves heaven. Elijah doesn't want to stay in heaven. Elijah comes down to help. That's the difference. Elijah doesn't want to luxuriate in heaven. He's not satisfied there. He's impatient there. He can't handle it. He goes to the yeshiva there. He's in the heavenly yeshiva. It's called the yeshiva shamala. Elijah is a card-carrying member of the yeshiva shamala. Who else, who else is in the yeshiva shamala? <laughs> Souls of the righteous who have passed away. And God. God is the Rosh Yeshiva. God's in the yeshiva, Eliyahu is in the yeshiva, and Shemot in the yeshiva. Maybe Enoch's there too, but Enoch is stuck there. Elijah comes down to help to communicate. So it's a very interesting parallel and, and contrast between. Uh, if there was one quick thing in, in chat, hi, I'm happy to. to ah. Thank you. Uh, in the, um, the Q and A we've got from Phil Miller, who sure. wants to know: based on these biblical sources, might the Pinchas and Eliyahu identity be a pre-rabbinic condition? I'm sorry, might, might they be what? A pre-rabbinic condition. I'm just reading. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Elijah and Pinchas, and we'll talk about this a little more next week. Elijah and Pinchas are separated by several centuries, right? By about 300 years, maybe. Pinchas lived in the time of Moses, right? Elijah is way, well after Solomon and David. Um, but we do hear that Pinchas lived an especially long life, even according to the Pshat. He, he's mentioned in the book of Judges. So this is, you know, hundreds of years after, a hundred, at least a hundred, two hundred years after Moses and, and the historical Pinchas. Somehow Pinchas' life is extended, even in the Bible itself. So you could stretch a little further and say Pinchas lived long enough that he turned into Elijah. That seems to be the claim. And you're right, it does not appear explicitly in rabbinic literature as a hint. <laughs> A few hints, uh, but it, it definitely was around. People were aware of that tradition. The rabbis seemed to be a little bit uncomfortable with it. Then in the Middle Ages, it becomes much more prominent. And actually, you have a statement that's that's formulated saying, Pinchas hu Eliyahu. Pinchas is Elijah. Not that they're both zealots, that we know, but actually that they're one and the same person. It's a bizarre claim, but it's, it's fascinating. And you're right, it probably is earlier than um, the Talmud or the, or the Mishnah, but it's kind of a subterranean tradition. And then it pops up, becomes more, more overt, more explicit in the Middle Ages. I see one last thing here. Maybe I'll just, I'll just mention in the, in the chat. Elijah is like a bodhisattva who returns to earth. It's a beautiful comparison. And I, I use that phrase. For those of you who don't know, bodhisattva is a term in Buddhism, refers to someone who is about to attain nirvana. He's about to attain the ultimate enlightenment and he says no 
I want to stay on earth. I choose to stay on earth to help other people be enlightened. It's very similar to what happens with Elijah, right? Enoch stays in heaven. Elijah could stay in heaven, but he wants to prepare the world for Mashiach. That's his goal, to pave the way for Mashiach. So he can't stay in heaven. And uh, he has to, he has to, to reappear. So, so he is, you could say he's a Jewish bodhisattva. I use that phrase in the book. I'm not the first uh, earlier writer describes him as that. You, you could call Elijah many, many, many things. He has so many titles. We'll talk about a few of them next week. Let me mention one more now. Uh, you may not like it, but he's called Ocher Yisrael, the troubler of Israel. Who calls him that? King Ahab. Ahab says, ah, now I see you, you troubler of Israel. And Elijah says, I don't trouble Israel. You trouble Israel because you worship Baal. But the troubler of Israel, it's a beautiful title in a way because Heschel has made this point that what is the job of a prophet? The job of a prophet is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, right? Not to let people stay in their, in their, uh, in their blindness, in their, in their mistake, in their, in their delusion. So Elijah is trying to shake things up. He, he can trouble you by, by showing you what really matters. What's interesting is that later, of course, he becomes the one who's gonna announce the Mashiach. He's the one who will bring the good news, right? Mevaser, that's not just a Christian term. Mevaser, besorot tovot. To bring good news is what Elijah is going to do to announce the Mashiach. But you could say in the Bible, he starts off by bringing what? Bad news. Elijah brings the bad news. It's going to be a drought because the people have rejected God. Eventually, he turns into the one who brings, brings the good news. Okay, I think we'll stop there and uh, continue next week. Wonderful to start exploring this. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you so much, Professor Matt. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today um, on Zoom, on Jewish Live, and on Facebook. Uh, we're going to continue with our LL programming today at 2.30 with a session from Dr. Jor Bondi's series, Heschel's Transformative Hasidism. So looking forward to any, seeing any of you who can make it. Um, and we also have the Middle School's Talmud program beginning tonight at 7 p.m. And there are still a couple spots. So please pass on that information to anyone who might be interested. We have over a dozen classes scheduled for Elismont, so you can learn more about them and register at l.trisha.org. Uh, thank you again to Professor Matt, and we will see you all next week. Thank, thank you. you. Be well.